Hey, welcome. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study. Really glad that you are with me today. We are going to get started here on Hebrews 13, 9 through 16. And this is lesson 13, and this is day seven. So let's go ahead and get everybody joining us. All right. Well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and jump right in. Father God, we do thank you for today. Thank you for just your love for us and the community that we have with one another and how we feel each other's love through that as well. Thank you for this group of women to come together for our time in the word uh, and just their, their encouragement to me and how much it means to all of us to have been through your word like this. So yeah, give us strength to continue and finish this book strong and in your grace and in your strength. Uh, not only that, but to really continue to foster and grow uh, I love in us for your word and to share that love with others as well. Bless our time together right now for our benefit, but for your glory. Uh, we want to share your love with others and help us to do that effectively today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's head on over to our lesson and say hi to the Facebook me. <laughs> All right. And like I said in the intro a minute ago, some of you heard that. Uh, you know, running start back at verse nine. And you're like, is it a typo? No, it's not a typo. We, I want to do verse nine again today and include that into today's study. So we'll hit that verse also. I'm going to take a drink of water here. And um, then we'll continue on. So let's go ahead and do our reading. And we'll begin with our memory verse, which is five and six. And then we'll jump over and do nine through 16. Our verse that we're memorizing is, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And uh, of course, if we're loving money over our love of God, then we won't be able to say that. But if we are all in and we full on love God more than anything else, we will be able to say that. All right. Verses 9 through 16. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest is a sacrifice for sin, as a sacrifice for sin, are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect, neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You know, once again, we come to a passage where I feel like we could spend an entire week just on this message. And, you know, I'm, we're approaching the day where I'll be teaching through all of chapter 13. And somebody already has asked me, how are you going to do all of that chapter 13? It's just like so much, right? So you can be praying for me as I work on my talk for our upcoming Bible studies. All right. Well, let's go over to the study and work through some of the questions and uh, the passage together. And you'll note, again, I'll read this at the top here. You'll note that we backed up and included 13.9 in today's passage. Keep that teaching in mind as you read today. Also, don't lose the greater context of Hebrews as you consider today's passage. The author has repeatedly turned our focus to Moses, the law, the tent, and the former sacrificial system and contrast that with Christ, through whom and by whom we have something better. So we have to keep that in mind in order for us to be able to understand this what somewhat complicated little portion of this chapter. So let's go ahead and do that. So number one, who gets to be included in the we, the author is referring to in 13N. And so make sure you, again, keep that in context and look back on uh, 13, uh, seven through nine. So let's take a look at that verse. Who gets to be included in the we? Well, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Well, what has he just said? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. It's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace and by foods. 
which has not benefited those who devoted to them. So we have an altar. So we are the ones who remember our leaders. We are the ones who receive the word of God, right? We are the ones who are observing the outcome of the, the, the leaders have gone before us. We are the ones who are imitating their faith. We are the ones that know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are the ones who are not being led away by diverse and strange teachings. We are the ones who realize that we need to be strengthened by grace and not by ceremonial foods and going through some kind of ritual and things like that, right? That's who the we are. We are the ones who put our eternal faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We are the ones who have this altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. These are the people who are being strengthened by food. They have no right to eat from there. They're, they're not, they don't get it. They haven't, but they're, they're not remembering that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So compare and contrast the privilege of the, at the altar, the new covenant with the altar of the old covenant. What kind of sacrifices were offered? What was the effect? What rights are afforded there? Is there anything else? Now, this is a digging deep portion here, and I'm counting on you to have done your work, to have done your study through the book of Hebrews. I think it would be challenging for anyone to come to this particular question if you're just brand spanking new to this study. So those of you who have invited a friend to join the study just recently, and um, you know, come alongside the people who are brand new, uh, because this, this particular question kind of presupposes that you understand some things that have gone on before, like what we've already learned and have understood. So, um, and those of you who are new, or even if those of you who are, are seasoned and have been through this study or are finding this question perplexing, I just want to encourage you, you know, trust the learning that you've done um, in the past 12 chapters that you've been through. Trust what you've come to understand about the old and the new covenant. And let me help you by walking you through some of those things. So he's already said, um, in terms of the people who come to this altar, um, we have a right to eat. He's referred to that in the scripture. You might want to have your scripture open and kind of be looking through that as I go through this right now. The thinking over there on the left is represented by the cross of Christ, and on the right, represented by a stone altar there. Might remind you of the altar that Abraham sacrificed Isaac, and the altar of the Day of Atonement, uh, the altars where all of the, the sheep um, from the Passover were sacrificed. So this is a stone altar versus Christ, um, our, our living sacrifice, right? Our, our newly sacrificed, as we, as we learned back in chapter... 10, I think it was. All right. Our freshly slaughtered sacrifice. Remember that one? Very graphic. All right. So we have a right to eat. That's over here with Christ. Um, and over here on the other altar, they don't have the right to eat. They don't, they can't come to this altar of Christ. Why? Because they're still sacrificing on this one. And remember, remember, remember the context. The Messianic Jews that he's writing to are people who are being tempted to go back to that altar, go back to the altar of stone where you're sacrificing a, a sheep that's going to be dead and you have to keep on doing it. They're tempted to not receive the new covenant, but to hang on to the old, right? Or somehow do some weird mix of both, strange and diverse teachings. Okay. All right. So the, um, the old covenant people don't have that same right. So New covenant then over here on Christ. We are sanctified people. We have been made holy. We are through the sacrifice that's been made once and for all. That's what our sacrifice is like. Uh, we can we can bear the reproach of Christ. Those are, those people who are still sacrificing over here on the stone altar, not bearing the reproach of Christ. Christ wasn't Christ wasn't sacrificed on a stone altar. Christ wasn't sacrificed repeatedly, like you warned in chapter six. If you don't receive him, it's like you're repeatedly bringing him to the altar and repeatedly sacrificing him over and over again. And it's no use to you, right, he says. Um, and then we can offer a different kind of sacrifice. Our sacrifice is a sacrifice. What does he say? What does the verse say? It's a sacrifice of praise from our lips, right? And... Not so with the sacrifice of the altar. This is an ongoing altar. It was never finished. It was never done. And it wasn't a sacrifice of praise. It was an actual literal sacrifice of an actual lamb on this altar there. Um, they had to keep offering those sacrifices annually. Christ was sacrificed over here once and for all. Um, and then people stayed in the camp. They did not share in their reproach. So over here on the sacrifice on stone, they stayed in the camp and uh, they did not bear the reproach. But Christ was outside the camp 
and we can go with him and bear his reproach. All right. So in terms of what, what is the same, the sacrificial lamb that was offered under the, on the Day of Atonement and the law that was required, if you remember that when we studied it, you remember that one of the goats that was taken was taken outside the camp and the sins were placed ceremonially on that scapegoat or the Azazel, it was called, scapegoat, and it was sent away from the camp. And um, so that is, that is that one commonality there because Christ was sacrificed outside the camp. All right. And, and then therefore the uh, the other commonality would be as a result of that sacrifice, the, the people were were sanctified by the by the blood of that lamb. Now, the old covenant, the people were sanctified temporarily, the new covenant forever, positionally the same forever. All right. Hopefully that helps clarify that. And once again, this is where you as a, a leader and an encourager in your group can come alongside people uh, who might be new and say, hey, how are you doing on this lesson? And there were some creepy questions there. You know, give them a call and let them know. And always encourage people to get into the study that we're doing here online because it's helpful. You're getting a lot more information here, right? Okay. So priests were permitted by the old covenant law to eat of the sacrifices that were offered. It was part of the agreement, part of the covenant. Here's a sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice all this part, the fatty portions, all the guts and all that stuff too. And then the priests were allowed to take some of that and actually have, a, have food out of it. Um, with one exception. Let's take a look at Leviticus 16.27, which explains what was to be done with the scapegoat sacrifice, and I mentioned that just a second ago. Where where was that offering taken and what was done with it? Now, again, I kind of alluded to that in um, this prior lesson <laughs> and, the, and the question right above it. So let's take a look. So, and the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make the atonement to the holy, in the holy place shall be carried outside the camp their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. They are taken outside the camp. So that's the day of atonement uh, offering that was different. And um, they were taken outside the camp and it was, they were burned up out there. All right. So let's take a look at Christ's suffering. What was the purpose of his? In Hebrews 9 and Hebrews um, 13, it repeats that as well. Let's take a look at those scriptures. For the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons at the ashes of the heifer, they sanctify the purification of the flesh. And then again in 13, 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to do what? To sanctify the people through his own blood. Okay. So what was the purpose of Christ's suffering? To sanctify, to make us holy. If you, if you forgot what sanctify means, you can go back again in the lesson and do that. Um, but the purpose of Christ's suffering is to make us holy, to make us uh, set apart and pure for, for God. So why do you think the author is urging them, us, to go outside the camp? What are the tempting alternatives? And let's take a look back at Hebrews 12 and um, at this other passage here in Hebrews 13. Jesus, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also say, lay aside every weight and the sin. And I mentioned how I'd like to insert the, the back in there. This is the ESV that omits that. But let us lay, lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and with awe. So uh, why do you think the author is urging them? Or, us by extension to go outside the camp. What are the tempting alternatives? I'm taking a look at these verses. Don't stay on and hold on to the old covenant. Therefore, let us consider Jesus. <laughs> We've got Jesus. All right. And let's get it and let's avoid getting involved in these strange and diverse teachings as trying to meld together the old and this, maybe the new covenant. Um, don't go do that. Go out, be counted with Christ, get outside of what you're tempted to be connected with and be with Christ. So how should we respond? What should be our complete focus? Let's read and paraphrase Hebrews 13 and that we'll do 13 through 16 together. And I'm really hopeful as you answer this, that you will draw from what you've studied in earlier chapters. Get that Bible scholar hat on and make those connections, my friend. Include references to other chapters as you are able. So, 
Again, this is me, the teacher, coming to you, the Bible study student. And, and, and that was exciting about this Bible study. And I, I hope that I've been effective in doing it this way. Because in the one sense, I'm, I'm just, I'm going before you, doing the study, helping you go through it. Um, but then on the other, we're peers here. We're shoulder to shoulder in God's word. It's not like I've got some superior, amazing knowledge above any of you. I've just got a lot more hours maybe going into it than you do. And, uh, and, and so this isn't me saying, gosh, you know, you guys should do better. This is me saying, come on, let's do better together. Let's get into the word together and bring in that, that knowledge and understanding that we've had from before. So how would we respond? What's our complete focus based on everything that we've studied in uh, Hebrews? First of all, and I've said this multiple times, I think I would wrap up everything with go to Jesus. Fix your eyes on him. Oh some water here go to jesus bear the reproach of christ nothing we have here is lasting nothing we have here we don't we this is going to be shaken we have zion okay our sacrifice is a sacrifice of praise why because the true sacrifice is done so it's once and for all so everything else that's left for us is the sacrifice of praise from our lips right and as romans 12 says and we'll talk about that later um our life right our lips and our life and we acknowledge his name, and we don't neglect to do good. So those are some thoughts of, for me in terms of summarizing and paraphrasing this passage here that I'd like to hear from you. So share that. Put that, if you're listening on YouTube right now, awesome. Thank you for doing that, by the way. But would you just write out what, how you would summarize this? How would you paraphrase this? Um, Facebook folks, do the same. When you get to this part, pause it, and just, I'd like to hear what you have to say. How would you summarize these verses 13 through 16? All right. We're going to think back and we're going to connect ahead. Think back and connect ahead. Let's read Hebrews 10.1. What was the sacrifice like under the old covenant? And some of you are like, I know, I know, because you remember and you're like going back to that verse in your brain. Christ's sacrifice was once and for all, for since the law has shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year by year, make perfect those who draw near. So what was the sacrifice like under the old covenant? It was ongoing. It could never make perfect those who drew near. And that might've been quite a gut punch for those. And remember it again in Hebrews, through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. So we're going back and then we're pointing forward. So their sacrifice was never complete and it never made them perfect. But a sacrifice of praise isn't an, even a new idea. Take a look at this in Psalms. And then consider the point and nature of our sacrifice uh, uh, of our sacrifice to God, now that we can come through Christ. Reread Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Do you see it? How does our daily life remind you of the nature of the old covenant sacrifice? So let's take a look at these verses in Psalms. Offer to God a sacrifice of sin. As his sacrifice glorifies me. To, the, to, um, to one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Let them... Uh, offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, Psalm 107, and tell of his deeds and songs of joy, Psalm 116. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Wow. All right. So, sacrifice in the, uh, um, under the old covenant was offered continually, but we are to offer up continually. That sacrifice in the old co um, covenant was offered continually, and it never, by that same sacrifice, made perfect those who draw near. What is different and the same? Well, in the new covenant, we are to offer a continual sacrifice, but not of a lamb, a sacrifice of praise. And that sacrifice is to be the one that's continuing on, because we have already been what? We've already been made perfect. We have already been sanctified. It was a completed act on the cross. So we're not offering a sacrifice of praise in the hopes that we'll be okay. And I praise you, God. I praise you, God. I praise you, God. And I hope this makes me perfect in your eyes. And I hope this does good for me. And I hope you consider my sacrifice. And I hope you come to me and, and fix my life. And I'm sorry for everything. No, there's none of that coming to God right now. For those of you who are covered by the blood of the Lamb, for those of you who are under the beautiful sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it's a once and done act. You have been made holy. You have been made perfect and so now our natural response is a continual act of worship 
in praise and response to that sacrifice, his sacrifice. No more of this continual sacrificing of a lamb or Jesus. The continual sense of it is us, and the sacrifice is our praise. Isn't that beautiful? Come on, I think that's great. Man, when I was reading that, I'm going, this is awesome. And had I not been reading all the way through all of Hebrews, I don't think I would have seen that because I've read this verse multiple times in my life before. You know, lips and sacrifice of praise from our lips and then this, the verses from Psalms. I've read those before. I've even sung there's a song. We being a sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. Remember that song? It's old Maranatha, I think, right? Anyway, I had a huge aha moment. I don't know, maybe you're not having that, but I did. I was like, oh my gosh. Jesus' sacrifice once and done. It's no more continual. My sacrifice is based on his sacrifice, and it is the continual one. It's a sacrifice of praise. How would your life look different if you lived out Hebrews 13, 15 through 16, consistently starting today? How would your church be impacted, your work, your family, your marriage? What would that look like if we were, if this defined who we were, if this is what we were like? How would that look? Well, Again, this is one of those personal response answers. I'm going to really, really plead with you to share them. And again, join the community. Be there on Facebook and YouTube and on the, on the podcast and whatnot and write it out and then share that. All right, You can handwrite it, take a picture of it, post it on Instagram, post it on Facebook, or you can just type it up and send it off to the Facebook and leave it in the comments there. I really want to hear what you have to say. I think if we lived this out, really lived this out, this would, trans this would change everything. If this happened, if this happened in my life, your life, all of our lives, imagine the difference. So consider this challenge for the next three days. Uh, begin and end each day intentionally living out these verses. Then ask a Bible study friend to join you so you can connect and see how it goes. I want to challenge you to do that today. I want you to reach out to somebody in your Bible study group and say, okay, I just finished day seven. And uh, there's a challenge at the end, and I pick you. Like, let's partner up and let's do this for three days, just three days, and commit to living this out, these verses out, verses 15 and 16 in particular. I encourage you to do that. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up, and I want to share this final word with you here. All right. Not too long ago, a young lady asked me what my church was like. She hadn't attended church in several years, but was thinking that she might go back. I stopped going because there were so many hypocrites there. What's your church like? I could tell that my response really caught her off guard. I said this, we have a ton of those at our church too. You know, hypocrites. She didn't quite know what to say and she thought it was joking. I wasn't. Well, I was a little. But I was trying to be a bit provocative so I could help her to see that her priorities in church searching were never going to get her what she was looking for. Our church is full of humans, I said. I'm afraid that if you're looking for a church with no hypocrites, fakes, people with issues or personality problems, you're going to have to just give up now. She giggled a little uncomfortably, and I added, what you will find at our church is real people who love Jesus. I'm not sure what they were like before I started attending, but when I arrived, they definitely had a hypocrite attending me. <laughs> I'm inconsistent, I'm annoying, I'm self-centered, I'm hypocritical, I don't always do the things that I ought to do, and I'm even paid to be a teacher of the Bible. What I do have is a love of God and a thankfulness for what God has done for me. I don't mess around with thoughts that I'm better than anyone else. I'm really probably a lot like uh, a lot like others. I'm just so ridiculously thankful that I have a church where I can go and be among people who get that. I'd say we're really just real at our church. At least we try to be. Do you still want to come? <laughs> I could tell that she was pretty shocked by my response, so I added, here's how I think about it. Church is centered on Jesus, and unlike me, he's the same yesterday, today, forever. Thank God for that, right? Our church is where you'll find truth in Jesus, not in people who will eventually let you down. How does that sound? <laughs> That sounds exactly like the sort of church I could get into, she said. Me too. I pray that as you conclude today's study, that you're seeing these same priorities. They're here to continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And what is that praise? It's the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. We exist to share what we have, our money, our time, 
our perfect lives? No, Christ. We have Christ. If I can bless someone with money and time, I'll thank God for that as well. But above all else, I'll share the best of what I have. And that is Jesus Christ. That is what I have. Wow. Thank you for being here. I got emotional today. But I love our church. I love, I love the fact that we have this community. Um, and obviously, I love Jesus a lot, too. And I want to make what we have here about him and sharing him. So please take up the challenge today. Please be a part of that and connect with somebody and uh, encourage them to, um, to finish strong in this Bible study. I know some people are maybe grow weary or feel like, oh, it's the last study. Maybe I won't finish it. But I just want to encourage everyone to finish strong and show up this coming week with every single lesson done. And it'll bless my heart. If, as you do, I'll be honest, as a teacher, it breaks my heart when people show up and haven't done the study. Um, and that's, I don't think that's a pride issue. It's just a sadness in my heart that they're, I know that they didn't experience what we all who did the study are experiencing. And I'm sad for them. I'm sad for what they missed out on. And, um, and so I want to encourage you to encourage the rest of the gals in the study to finish strong. Let's be in this together. And let's take these three days to, to really come together and to meet that challenge with one another. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here with me on today's study. If you love, if you like the study, share it. Let other people know about it. And don't forget, this is uh, something I've asked for the last couple of days. Go on to Google, find La Mirada Christian Church, and leave us a good Google review. Just hit that five star and say, I love our church. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. And remember, as always, you are loved and prayed for. Bye-bye.